Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome you to FSD Kenya's seventh annual lecture. Now, if these were normal times, we would have just shared a cup of chai, had some bitings, and talked about what was happening around Kenya and around the world. But these are not normal times. This is our second virtual lecture, and we're coming to you live from FSD Kenya's office today. You know, the reason FSD Kenya started this annual lecture series is really to raise the discourse around the importance of inclusive finance. What role can finance play in making it better for people so that low-income households can get access to the financial solutions they need to manage day-to-day, -day, deal with risks, and importantly, invest in the future? How can finance help micro, small, and medium enterprises really deliver on the their dreams to grow and to employ more and more people in Kenya. You know, as, as we face COVID right now, there are so many challenges facing Kenya besides COVID. Climate change is top of mind with COP26 coming soon. And what role can finance play in helping the fi everyone, helping the economy be more green and have a greener economy and a, and a better future? Well, I am joined today by a fantastic lecturer, Bitange Ndemo, and uh, four uh, panelists, including our moderator, um, Anzetse. But I'll, I'll leave all the introductions and, and all of that to my colleagues. Um, but what I wanted to do is really introduce our lecturer. Now, in, if you've been with us in the past, you know that we've invited Kenyans, we've invited non-Kenyans, we've had men, women, economists, all kinds of different people. But like I said, the reason we have this annual lecture is to raise the discourse. And so we hope that today makes you think. Maybe you don't agree with everything that's said. Maybe you really agree with it. Feel free to use the hashtag FSD lecture to share your ideas, share your thoughts, share your questions, and be part of this digital conversation. As I said, we wish we were in person. We wish the 915 of you who registered were here and we could talk with you. But that is the power of digital. We can talk with you through this medium. And so it, it's no substitute for being in person, but we hope that you get a lot out of today. I met the, this afternoon's lecturer for the first time in 2012, when he was still the permanent secretary at uh, the Ministry of ICT in Kenya. It was a government meeting with all protocols observed, and yet I was so impressed by this man who I had just met, who was ready to get things done. He really wanted to change things. We were talking about digitizing government payments and the power of digital and those payments and what that can do to deliver better services, reduce corruption, and other many benefits to digital government payments, government digital payments. And we've had the opportunity to interact many times since then on panels and discussions. And in the last year, as we've been dealing with COVID, our team and he have discussed what does it look like, what's the power of digital, but who's being left behind? Who might be excluded in this digitalization of the economy? And so it is my extreme pleasure, and I should say he really needs no introduction. As I said, he was the PS Ministry of ICT. He's currently a professor at the University of Nairobi. We hope some of his students have joined us tonight. Um, and um, I think without any further ado, I would ask the panelists to join me in welcoming uh, Bitanga Ndemo to deliver our seventh annual lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks again, Tamara, for a wonderful introduction. And uh, Deputy uh, Commissioner and Director of Development at the British High Commission, um, Julius. Tamara, uh, my friend here, Anne Mutai, and um, Njiru, who is uh, a director for Food for Education. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm greatly honored to join you this afternoon uh, to present the seventh FSD 
Kenya annual lecture, which is on inclusive finance. The title of my presentation is Digitalizing Emerging Models of Economic, Emerging Economic Models uh, for Development and the Role of Fintechs. In my view, after three industrial revolutions, Africa has yet to meet the world as an equal power. We, we now have the opportunity to integrate emerging fourth industrial revolution technologies into the heart of Africa. And in doing so, also potentially heal the um, potentially heal past digressions that we've had. At the dawn of the first uh, industrial revolution, Africa was dealing with slavery. Towards the end of 19th century, and as the second industrial revolution was starting, the continent was in the thick of colonialism. When the third industrial revolution emerged in the mid 1920, mid 20th century, uh, Africa was at war with the colonial governments. Then the Cold War uh, started uh, to further digress the, the continent from the path of development. In the early 21st century, we witnessed intense investments in the information and communications technologies in Africa. These investments gave rise to innovation in especially fintechs. The prevalence of fintechs has been pronounced to such an extent, extent that the International Monetary Fund noted um, in one of its documents that Sub-Saharan Africa has become the global leader in mobile money transfers, transfer services spreading widespread access to financial services. As the world wakes up to the fourth industrial revolution, uh, there is no doubt that Africa could take advantage of, growing, of the growing number of talent that it has, increasing urbanization, continued development uh, in the infrastructure, and regulatory regimes that are actually uh, enabling, innovation, enabling innovation. Africa is at the verge of, uh, of the tipping point. And this would help it to join the global place. We must, however, lead Africa onto <clears throat> the world stage together by anchoring these innovative technologies uh, to support a solid path of economic development and sustainability. We first acknowledge the fact that from slavery to colonialism and the Cold War, Africa's resources developed much of the world. The development agenda in post-independence Africa was marred by Cold War uh, digressions uh, where we had failed leaderships as a result of uh, external interferences, coups and counter coups, uh, which were precipitated by co contending powers. Then globalization came. Its ugly face of capitalism ex exacerbated inequality, inequalities not just in the developing world, but began to decimate the middle class in the developed world. Once more, we face the risk of another di digression, the emerging tension between US and China. These geopolit geopolitics could hold back Africa if we are not careful. We need technology to change business models that will change the livelihood of our people. It is such changes that will stop the continent from the disease of dependency on aid. Early this week, actually on the 4th, I read an article by a lady known as Jacqueline Novogratz, published in the Foreign Affairs, a US uh, magazine. The title of the article was, The Trouble with Business Schools, MBA Programs Should Teach Sustainable Capitalism. The article was very interesting. 
She argues that inequality is rising, democracy is in jeopardy, catastrophic climate change is looming, just like Tamara was talking about, and the COVID-19 pandemic has uncovered vast disparities in healthcare and food security. The demand for moral, visionary leadership has never been greater. Um, however, business schools, which are responsible for producing many of the next generation executives, are falling behind. Further, she says building truly inclusive businesses and consequently enterprises that can reduce inequality requires guaranteeing that all actors in the value chain can survive and prosper. Most multinational corporations that we have had around, sub, uh, their supply chains place the most risk on the people who can least afford to lose money, while rewarding well-protected asset holders almost entirely. In explaining her point, she provides two conflicting examples in the chocolate industry. Over 80% of cocoa is produced by two million smallholder farmers in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. However, they receive less than 6% of the price of a stand, <coughs> standard chocolate bar. And their average daily wage is only 78 cents US dollar. There are many initiatives inside the chocolate business to address and monitor some of the issues caused by this unequal distribution of profit, but for far too long, corporations have basically outsourced the work of mending a falling model uh, by making significant payments to organizations and charities. While charitable <coughs> organizations can help people reimagining business structures and value chain is a better way to go. A more humane business model is emerging in the same cocoa industry. A small, uh, small older cocoa farmers, for example, uh, are given ownership shares in a British farm called Divine Chocolate. And as a result, they receive around 44% of the, pro the company's profits. Instead of pushing Band-Aid solutions geared only to offset reputational problems, business schools should introduce students to these types of models, she noted. Novogratz, um, in her article, presents the problems that have faced Africa, and it not only provides the solution now, but also for our future endeavors as the world moves into the fourth industrial revolution. In the past few decades, in the first few de decades, the mantra in Africa to was to industrialize if we have to create the employment for the burgeoning population. This thinking arose from other Lewis's model. Uh, this is a 1954 model, economic model for development in which he explains the growth of a, a developing economy in terms of labor transitions between two sectors, that from the capitalist sector and the subsistence sector. Lewis, however, did not take into consideration the importance of technology and its effects on his model. But the current shift of workers from lower high to higher productivity employment is fueled by digitalization. So the trust of my argument, uh, therefore, is that digitalization and the fourth industrial revolution technologies will form the backbone of Africa's economic transformation. I would dig deeper uh, on digitalization and begin to show um, 
to show what it can do to our economies. The Gartner reports uh, define digitalization as the use of digital technologies to change business models. And this is what I was referring to, the changing business models which are changing livelihoods of people in several places. They provide new and value producing opportunities and it's a process of moving uh, to a digital business. This is what I was referring to when I was talking about no gratis. Um, so if I can quickly go into the fourth industrial revolution and go through it quickly, during the first industrial revolution mechanization, I said Africa was steeped in, the, in slavery at the time. The second came, Africa was being colonized at the time. The third, we were trying, Africa was trying to fight colonialism. So the fourth industrial revolution is one which we can say that Africa is sort of settled, understands what is happening around them, and they could begin to do something. What you need to understand in this space are the technologies that will define the fourth industrial revolution. These are just a, naming a few big data, blockchain, AI, internet of things, machine learning. Uh, these are some of the key technologies that define um, the fourth industrial revolution. If you look at Africa today, these technologies are in use. When we talk about inclusive financial, uh, the fintechs, um, inclusive financial services, you cannot talk about that without big data, without the use of artificial intelligence. This is what has led to credit scores and the giving loans which are non-collateralized and indeed in bringing more people into the financial sector. So the fourth industrial revolution is very, very critical to Africa that we can now begin either forget the past and begin to look forward and exploit the future. My argument is that we are in the better position to exploit this fourth industrial revolution than any other continent in the world. So these technologies, people may ask what is happening. You would see later the talent is increasing in Africa and the efforts to create much larger or more young people into learning these areas. Personally, I'm involved in discussing with universities across the world to be able to begin uh, to train young people in this space. But one thing I must say is that unlike in the past, when we relied mostly on governments to initiate like what training is going to be there in the coming days, um, individuals are taking their own responsibility and the beginning to look at what is it going to happen such that we can do it. Even though our universities could be behind in this space, we have the private sector which has moved in that direction, several corporations which are moving into that space and developing the capacities that would help the continent to tip and become one of the most competitive uh, elements in the world. So we have what I call the Great Reset. This is COVID. COVID-19 has forced the world to reset and accelerate to, to live differently. Uh, for example, when COVID began, it didn't take most African universities to switch to remote teaching. So the way we learn is changing, the way we work is changing, the way we socialize, the way we shop, the way we worship has changed, and even collaborations with other parts of the world is changing. And so I would call this the moment, the watershed moment for digital transformation in Africa, um, that we can look at businesses, create the new businesses, and create the new revenue models. Um, then the rules of success have changed and are ever more reliant on harnessing the power of digital models to create uh, new value and experiences. What has happened uh, over the past, since 1990s, 
when the internet came first. Usually, this curve, we use it to explain um, how adoption of innovation happens in any community. You have very few people at the beginning playing with it. Then you have early adopters, then early majority, then late majority. When internet came in the 1990s, not many of us understood how to commercialize it. What happened is that the Americans understood what it was. They developed the search engines, the web browsers, and actually became big. Uh, they created big businesses. The next wave of technology was mobility. It came around 2000. Again, here, not Europe, not Africa, not Asia understood except China, which said something is, is, would come out of this. And this is how you see mobile platforms came. Uh, you see um, social media platforms came leveraging mobility. And they created a lot of money, both America and China. But the rest of the world didn't take advantage of this. They did not take advantage. Now we are dealing with the consequences of not having been in that space because some of those companies have become too big. Most of you know Facebook now. It's as the center of everything. Twitters, um, several other social media platforms. Now, we are moving to what we call the, the third wave blockchain. Um, many people don't quite understand how, what would come out of this. But again, Americans had gone ahead uh, with cryptography, uh, cryptocurrency, um, bitcoins, ethereums. They came up very quickly. They have gotten some money. But there lies a lot of opportunity for us, huge opportunity to create new innovations. And I can confirm here that Africa is going to play in that space very big. Um, of course, China saw America going forward. They moved one step higher. They now have their central bank digital currency, which has shaken the entire world. And you are beginning to see from Europe to America now rushing to create a, a CBDC. Uh, the good thing is that Africa, especially in Kenya here, we have been using digital currency that our president, when COVID struck, said we shouldn't use cash, we should use the digital platforms. We would get into that space very quickly. But you are going to see a lot more innovations. Already we have small companies that have been created, especially in streamlining of the supply chains. This is very critical for us here in Africa because uh, by streamlining, streamlining supply chains, you are impacting the entire micro, small, and medium enterprises. And the elusive industrialization of Africa will come out of this space because once you begin to streamline the supply chain, especially in the agricultural sector, you get forced to find what to do with some of the surpluses which would mean that manufacturing or value addition would come naturally because we have, we're trying to streamline the supply chain. There are more other opportunities which you are going to see, some of the startups I see coming up. So the disruption solutions would be many from the blockchain, from other parts of the world, not just America and China, as it happened during internet and the mobility period. So what is changing? Africa is wired. <clears throat> Africa has sufficient um, capacity. I remember um, in 2007 with my minister, Mutai Kawe, um, the entire Africa had one cable on the West Coast, which was so expensive to call the US it used to be $12. Europe, it was be $8. All exchange points, the telephone exchange points were either in London, Paris, or Portugal, depending on which country colonized Africa. 
And that made it very expensive for Africa to use telecommunications. And the first thing we did was that we must lower this cost by linking Africa to the rest of the world through the undersea. And in this, all multilateral agencies were saying, uh, why would you invest in the undersea, which would give you terabytes when you are only using 0.3 of a terabyte? And we said there is latent demand. Nobody would understand. And so we actually broke from the arrangements that we had, which were supported, again, uh, through aid money, we decided that we would invest on our own. We approached some companies to invest from um, the US, Europe. They couldn't invest because there was no market. Uh, but soon after we landed the cable, every company wanted to be in Africa because the uptake was so fast, we created the market. Today, some of the social media platforms, Facebook is doing a around Africa cable, which we did not think that we would have anybody invest in that space. Um, this is important to, so that we begin to understand that initiatives that are started here to deal with market failure would actually open up Africa. And this is what we've been failing to, to discuss, that Africa needs to take a lead on it development. So what is happening is that Africa internet economy um, now is around 120 billion. Uh, in 2025, it will be 180 billion. This is data from the IFC. The number of young people, the talent, is about 700,000. Uh, this is sufficient to take Africa forward. Because everybody says, oh, Africa is still, it hasn't come. You don't need 100% to transform an economy. You just need a good number of young people in that space. The tech talent is growing. We have some, I think, two, 300,000 in the pipeline. And there are plans to actually begin to move some of them into the space uh, that is not being taken care of and the space that is going to be the future, mostly around um, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Um, this is the area where we need to invest a lot more. Urbanization is going up. Bro innovator regulations, um, beginning from M-Pesa to where we are, most regulators now understand they must be able to enable uh, people to come up with new ideas. Um, if you look at the, what the government of Kenya, for example, has done, they moved forward to create the artificial intelligence and blockchain task force, which has made several recommendations. Those recommendations will deal with so many of the problems that Africa has around corruption. There will, there will be much more transparency. But look at the infrastructure development. Even though only 40% of the Africans have connectivity, uh, some countries have 80, 90%, but for every 10% increase um, in this, uh, in the number of people with connectivity, you raise the GDP by 2.5%, which is higher than any other part of the world. So Africa would intensify infrastructure development, especially in the ICT sector. They see it necessary now from COVID, by, from what COVID has created. If you look, the entire globe, Africa is growing faster than any other part of the world. Latin America is at 1.7, uh, EU is 1.7, um, Africa is growing at 4%. Some of the fastest growing countries in the world are in Africa. This is why I say that Africa is getting to a tipping point, a point at which we would begin to see Africa moving faster and playing its role in the global economy. If you look at uh, what I've said, you can actually begin to measure. Um, I happen to be working with the World Data Lab. 
um, where we work through the incomes and demographics. Um, this time machine would actually tell you what would happen. Africa would have the most number of people in the future who can be deployed to work in the space of IT, simply because the average African is 19, compared to the rest of the world, where in some cases the average person age is around 50. This is what gives Africa the opportunity to play a bigger role in the emerging, in this emerging technology. Around innovation, if you look at investments, venture investment, venture capital investment in Africa, the, it reached all time high in 2019, then COVID came, went down to about 900. But if you look at the numbers now, 2021, it's already gone past 1.5 billion in terms of venture capital investment in Africa. This is positive message. This is where the youth that I'm saying, who uh, everybody looks at and says, if I had that many youth, I could be able to do much better. So um, Africa, continental free trade area, uh, the potential market of 2.6 trillion. Um, you are going to see the 1.3 African billion Africans taking advantage on this. As I speak more about fintechs, fintechs have opened up the borders. Fintechs um, are playing a major role. They are driving Africa into Africa trade, and I have I've begun to use African currencies. This is something new, unlike the past, where we had to buy the dollar or the euro in order to trade between Kenya and Tanzania or Uganda. So they are enabling greater financial inclusivity, impacting especially micro, small, and medium enterprises, which create most of Africa's employment, and they give opportunities. You read, for example, Ecobank's Finitech Challenge Fellowship that is helping Finitechs to, to scale in Africa. We've never had an African initiative to begin to scale up such, but we are now beginning to see banks getting into that space. They are driving innovation and agility that today is responsible for Africa's improved productivity. Productivity has improved virtually in every sector, from health, education, to financial services, it's improving. Then mitigating information friction in financial supply chains through leveraging AI, blockchain, and creating greater efficiency. This is what I had said earlier, that through AI, we are able to provide new loans that were never there with the, with the bigger banks that we, we still have. So fintechs are at the center of the new economy. What is happening is that intra-Africa trade is going to succeed much faster than we ever thought. Because if you see um, Flutterwave in Nigeria is opened up, not just Anglophone countries, but into the Francophone countries. Then you are beginning to see employment opportunities, almost six million jobs would be created out of um, Africa's integration because we are now able to do cross-border trade without looking for other productivity improvement throughout Africa. Then we, have, we can leverage AI to actually reach those who have never been reached before. Um, I would say in most countries, especially um, the big four, as they call them, Kenya, Nigeria, Ghana, and Egypt, which have adopted some of, of these solutions, are doing very well. But what is happening is that the neighboring countries are actually uh, also saying we can succeed and they're beginning to get into that space. If you look at Tanzania, for example, it was late coming into the mobile money, but just because their neighbor had done it, they said we must succeed. It's the fastest growing now with respect to use of mobile money. And this is good. It would have that same effect to Zambia, Zimbabwe, to South Africa. So soon we will be talking a different thing about Africa.
So what I need us to take away is that digital consumption growth is fueled by fast growing urban and mobile population. Internet infrastructure investments are a further boost in connectivity. We are beginning to see people talk about 5G. We know that intra-Africa fiber has gone in most part except Central Africa, which was experiencing war, and I'm sure it's going to come back and join the rest of African countries. Tech ecosystem driven by dynamic development and startup landscape from just one hub in Africa. Uh, now we have almost 700 hubs, thousands of young people coming up with new innovations. And this is what we want to see. The good thing, yeah. or what God has given us, are the problems. And any of the problems, you flip it, it's an opportunity. We have had problems in the SME sector, and what I see are opportunities in the space, and you are going to see more and more being disrupted. And the, what I talked about other Lewis earlier, that we would shift people from, digitalization would shift people from low productivity to higher productivity levels. It is going to happen, especially in the MSMEs, because once you digitalize these MSMEs, they actually become formal because they can't hide from government and be able to take advantage of the ICTs. So pro-innovation regulation can benefit the African internet economy. Of course, most African countries have gone ahead also to begin to look at blockchain. What is it going to do to those economies? In some, we have very cautious regulators, but it's going to happen anyway in that space. I keep on repeating on this because we need to leverage blockchain to create tokens around the resources Africa has to raise sufficient resources to educate young people and create a pool of highly educated young people who can not only work in Africa but can work in every part of the world because that is what is going to be the future. And so I thank you for listening to me and look forward to more questions. Thank you Thanks. so much. Welcome back, and you've probably been seeing some videos of the different activities we've been doing with micro, small, and medium enterprises, a lot of whom have been leveraging the great insights that Dr. Ndemo has really been detailing in this talk, and he's really given us such wonderful food for thought for this panel. And so I'll just introduce by sharing who's on the panel. Of course, we have Dr. Ndemo himself, so welcome to the panel. But beside me, we have Anne Mutahi. Um, she's the senior um, SME advisor to the, to the president, um, and she's a reputable, reputable SME specialist has a wealth of experience in the SME sector and financial services sector. She's particularly passionate about women and equipping them with financial tools and non-financial solutions to help them leverage their assets and also has extensive experience in governance, having served on several NSC listed companies. And she's also the past chair of the board of the Standard Chartered Bank. She's an alumni of the University of Cape Town. Um, welcome, Anne. Thank you. Thank um, we also now have Julius Court. Um, Julius is born and raised in Kenya. Um, he's a Deputy High Commissioner and Development Director to Kenya. The other senior roles that Junius has had is the Head of DFID Strategy Unit, the Head of the UK Government Prosperity Fund, the Head of DFID Ethiopia, and he's also been posted in South Sudan, Nigeria, and Japan. That's an interesting mix. And prior to joining the civil service, he worked with the UN and the Overseas Development Institute. Welcome, Julius. And finally, we have Wawira. Um, Wawira is the founder of Food for Education, and in 2016, she was selected as one of the 25 young Africans leading in public life by the University of Cape Town in 2016. She is one of the 16 participants of the Global Social Benefit Institute Accelerator Program. She was also, she's also Stanford School alumni, um, the youngest recipient of the University of South Australia's Alumni Award. Um, she's also a Rainer Arnold Fellow and recipient of the Builders Africa Award in 2018. Welcome, Wawira. Thank you. So I think I'll just go ahead and start with you, Anne. You know, 
in addition to sort of giving us the key points that you've taken away from what Dr. Ndemo was talking about in his lecture, um, I think I really want you to talk about over the past year and a half, as Nemo mentioned, we've really seen COVID-19 ravage yeah. um, the Kenyan economy and particularly impact low-income Kenyans. You sort of sit as you sort of the senior advisor to SME development, looking at the ways Kenyans actually earn a living. So maybe you can unpack for us. Um, what are the key impacts you've seen, particularly on the micro and small businesses? And what has your office been doing to sort of address that um, and help Kenyans sort of come back uh, to dignified living? Thank you very much, Andesa, for that question. And warm greetings to all the virtual listeners on this FSD um, um, lecture. I also want to just uh, um, uh, um, note that um, FSD has continued to raise a discussion um, around um, not only fintechs, but what can actually be done in the SME, MSME sector. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Demo. I think there were very key points, as you said, um, that do impact um, uh, what can be done within not just the um, SMEs, but indeed the economy. And what he said is that it was a great reset, which had um, problems, challenges for a lot of the MSMEs. As you know, 20% of them actually shut down completely, um, whereas 70%, according to um, studies that have been done by the CBK, and also FinTech, um, FinAccess um, barely survived. And why is this? We all know that right across the world, there was a huge fall in demand, which meant that uh, there was slower customer footfall. There was also greater business costs because of the fact that, um, you know, the whole supply chain became extremely expensive. And um, when you look at what it is that um, we were able to do as government and as private sector, because I believe it had to be a collaborative effort, what you find is that um, government was able to work through its different partners in trying to bring down a lot of the costs. CBK, as you know, brought down mobile um, for, uh, costs in terms of transfers. You had the uh, relaxation of a lot of the taxes. There was a lot of encouragement to ensure that financial providers gave more space to a lot of the um, MSMEs in terms of payment. Uh, what we also saw was that um, there was a lot more procurement that was now um, engineered, or should I say focused, toward the MSME sector partly because, of course, the borders were closed. So it gave us a moment to look internally and begin to see actually what we do have. And as Dr. Demo said, um, and I think it's a, it's a truism, that the fact that um, we had a problem actually brought on um, a different change in terms of looking at the opportunities. One of the opportunities I think that we did see uh, very clearly is that um, we were able to um, appreciate that there was a lot more uh, should I call aspirational and small businesses within the MSME ecosystem and that we were able then to begin to leverage a lot of those companies to greater heights. Um, so there is a lot of effort in terms of new models as you had said um, of how are they going to survive. You've seen a lot of MSMEs um, reorganize themselves and I really want to uh, commend I think um, entrepreneurs right across the, the divide of both formal and informal for their resilience and their innovation in terms of trying to um, come back. I think as we look at um, how do we actually um, come back better, um, this is a great moment in time to be able to um, you know, use some of the uh, digital um, opportunities that are there. Um, as we said, we have every single advantage. Uh, most of those MSMEs are under the age of 35. Uh, most of them are digitally connected in one way or the other. Um, probably there's a need for a more improved handsets to be, to, to be able to make communication better. But what you have actually seen even now is that within the private sector, there's also been great strides in making sure that MSMEs are not what they were before. When you look at what Safaricom is doing right now in terms of beginning to distinguish enterprises from um, um, individual trading, that is actually a great door that has opened um, you know, for us in terms of moving forward with being able to access a lot of the assets that are there. What you're also finding is a lot of training and um, should I say business support services are now available you know, digitally. That um, again is I think a great beginning into what can happen when we go forward with that. Well, that means that um, not only can you connect and be able to network um, you know, digitally, um, but also that, um, as you're saying, a lot of the costs that um, have been in business will actually come down. So I agree that it's a, a time for re-looking at the models of business. Um, it's a time to also see 
this whole sector no longer as Juakali, but as enterprises, enterprises of Kenya, and be able to value them um, in that particular fashion. And also, I think, also um, is, a, is, a, is a moment of, I think, reflection. And it, it requires, I think, all the different players right across the divide of both private sector and uh, public sector to come together and begin to see and ask themselves, you know, how are we going to reimagine a different entrepreneurial uh, society? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And in fact, Thank Julius, just on the sort of the global impact that COVID has had, you obviously have a, an eye on countries outside of Kenya. So maybe you can just give us your insights on what have you seen as the key impacts on the Kenyan economy and the Kenyan um, uh, people uh, from a COVID perspective? So uh, thank you very much. Another uh, great question. And uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Ndemo for really an absolutely uh, brilliant lecture. And what I took away from it is you had this, this broad historical sweep, but what was particularly golden is you gave us that look into the future. And, and the future is very clear, it's digital. And uh, it's really important that all of us um, understand that and that we, we have that mindset that the future, wherever we are, uh, is going to be a digital future, whether you're, you're a young person hustling uh, here in Nairobi, uh, whether you're running a small firm, whether it's a bigger firm, uh, whether you're in government, that, that's exactly what's, uh, what's going to happen. So, so, so to answer your question, I think, I think we've been looking at three things um, in particular. We've, we've, of course, been looking at health issues because um, COVID has, has hit health globally. And particularly here in Kenya, we've been, we've been working with the government uh, on the health response. And uh, we've also been working very much on the economic response. So when you, when you look at, um, we, we worked with, for example, uh, Cabinet Secretary Minor on the business situation room and, and just helping learn from the global experience about you know, how, you, how you set up the protocols to run an economy during a COVID phase, you know, things like this. So, uh, so, that's, uh, so that's one side on the health side, but then linking, of course, uh, to the economy. We've been very much involved in, um, in supporting Kenya with, uh, with, the, with the financial pressure it's been under, whether it's been through the World Bank or IMF or others. Um, so there's, there's those kinds of things. And then the third thing is, is, is uh, trying to help, uh, in a small way, uh, as we can, uh, help ordinary Kenyans who've been so hit by this, uh, by this crisis, which again has been this combination of health and economic and social, actually. And um, so, so we've tipped some of our programs into, you know, instead of direct support um, in, in some of the more disadvantaged areas, actually it's now cities that have been hit the hardest. So trying to uh, help individuals in cities. Um, but then also we're, we're really proud that um, earlier this summer, our Prime Minister and His Excellency President Kenyatta, they co-hosted co the Global Education Summit. And one of the key aims, apart from to raise lots of money, which we did, was actually to focus on education and say, actually, the place for young people is back in school. And so, you know, that was, that was the key thing. And the key thing they should be learning there is how you operate, of course, in a, in a kind of modern digital world, in a digital uh, economy. So those are the kinds of things that we've been, uh, we've been thinking about. Wonderful. And that leads well to you, Wabir, because obviously um, you work closely with children and farmers to link good quality food to schools um, and school-going children. And sort of we saw the impact COVID had on the education sector. So can you give us a look at how did that impact your work and your ability to adapt and still get the meals to children, especially when they started, you know, resuming school? Yes. Yeah, so um, first of all, obviously, to thank uh, Professor Ndemo for his wonderful lecture. I really appreciated the historical perspective, as Julia said, and also the look into the future and how digitization plays a part and is really the key to uh, the Africa securing its place in the fourth revolution. Uh, for us, during um, when March 2020 hit and you know COVID-19 was declared a pandemic and schools were closed, it was a very, you know, first of all, shocking time for a lot of people, including for a lot of our students and their families. So there was a lot of uncertainty around when will this end? When will we start again? And we also didn't know what would happen, right? We thought it's a two week thing. Everything is gonna open back in two weeks. Um, and we soon realized that this was not going to be a two week uh, event. And so what we did was we first started understanding what were our families going through. So we have our, uh, we had developed this technology called Tap to Eat, which is this wristband here that holds information of families. And what we do is uh, initially pre-COVID-19, parents would top up 15 shillings 
for each meal that we deliver to their children and they will use M-Pesa mobile money to be able to top up to an e-wallet account and if children would wear this to school and validate uh, during lunchtime and get their lunch. So we had their information, we had data that enabled us to say, okay, what if we reach out to all these parents and find out what is happening. So how is COVID-19 impacting their lives? So we reached out to you know, parents through SMS, through, call, through our call center, asking questions of, you know, have you lost income? How much income have you lost? Or um, are you still in Nairobi? That's also a question of have you moved because there was a lockdown. And we found that yes, majority of our parents were still in Nairobi but around 60 to 80 percent had lost income and that income was quite significant it was over 60 percent of their income had been lost drastically overnight because if you're talking about parents in public primary schools most of them are casual laborers so if companies are deciding they're going to cut numbers they're the first to go uh, most of them have small businesses if everyone is staying at home they're the ones who are not getting income uh, most of them are doing jobs of going to wash people's homes people's homes people People's clothes and if everyone is staying at home no one's going to need someone to come and wash their clothes and so they'd lost significantly you know all their income and so we thought how do we respond to this and we moved from uh, so initially which is still happening now that schools are back our logistics model works that we source food centrally so we source from smallholder farmers we have a you know not so sophisticated sourcing platform <laughs> I say not so sophisticated because we're trying to make it better but we're sourcing you know ingredients for around 30 30,000 kids every single day, uh, bringing that food to different kitchens, producing, uh, cooking the food centrally and using trucks to distribute to those schools. So we had a distribution model that was working really well when schools were in session. And when schools closed, we had no distribution model because we could cook food, but we had no way to get it out to students because students were not in school. So we really had to redesign how we do distribution from how do you assemble, you know, a thousand students who've been assembled in a school and now doing a thousand distributions to their homes. So we designed a model where instead of doing hot food, which we deliver daily, we started delivering dry food to families. And we couldn't only give the one child who's registered on tap to eat. We had to feed the entire family because all the kids from who are at boarding school are now home. The parents are also home. And we had to think, what is a package that you can give a family and how can you do this distribution for we're talking thousands of families in ways that is safe, in ways that doesn't create chaos. Because if you're doing food distribution during a pandemic when everyone else has lost income, how do you verify that? And so we, used, we leaned on <clears throat> Tap to Eat, our technology, to first verify our beneficiaries, to know who are we giving food to and who are we not giving food to and also to reach them by using you know, information data on where do they live, how do we aggregate 10 people here, five people there versus you know, 1,000 people in one single location. The other thing we did is um, we actually partnered with S FSD Kenya during that time. Uh, there was a, uh, an initiative called Shikilia where we had data of payments, so how parents had been paying pre-COVID, and we could assess there is a level of vulnerability here. For example, a parent who pays an average of 20 shillings versus a parent who pays an average of 100 shillings. There's a very big difference in terms of how these payments are happening. So it means this parent has 100 shillings and another one doesn't have, can only get 20 shillings. And so we said, can we assess vulnerability through payment data? And we were able to di disburse cash transfers for, first of all, parents who could not access the food packages who'd been locked outside Nairobi, but also parents who are the most vulnerable using payment data. And we ran a cash transfer of 3,000 shillings for three months, and it was transformational. You know, the parents really, really appreciated, and it held on. It exactly did that. She cleared them during that time. Thank you. That's really inspiring and sort of linking <coughs> payments to very remote regions, and that's where I want to talk to you, um, Dr. Ndemo, you know, you talked about the role of fintech, and we, I really want to look at what is, what are you seeing as the emerging links between Africa and Asia? Often that connection is not one people make in fintech, but we know it's there, we know it's deep and it's burgeoning. So maybe you can give us insights on what have you seen in the trends in the fintech space linking Africa and Asia, especially since COVID started? 
Thank you for that question, uh, which I didn't have enough time to elaborate. Um, there is actually very close links between Asia and, uh, and Africa with respect to uh, fintechs. Um, if you look at uh, the, for example, the entry of Ant into Africa, I think they started from South Africa and they, they want to, because of what has happened in, in China, I think they want to, to develop the international market. And that is good because they, they are at a very, very, very advanced level with AI and other technologies, which we need to um, allow our young people to, uh, to get to work in that space and get the experience. There are also um, younger people who I know go through Nigeria. There is something we call Big Four in, with respect to these innovations. And this big four is South Africa, Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, Egypt. So if you go to the hubs in those spaces, you actually find Asian, young Asians also trying to crack through the African market. They are looking almost into the same space that we've been looking. Everybody sees the problems we have in SMEs. Uh, and they, they want to crack it and be able to provide finances, streamline those supply chains. These are the areas we are finding them. Uh, they are also looking forward, and this is now big, where you are finding Japan, for example, uh, is trying to get into the token space. They are trying to look at what we did, uh, for example, in the report, the recommendation of sandboxes, especially at the CMA. They want to be among the first ones to come and create tokens out of the African assets. Uh, this is something like the Western world has not begun to think about, uh, but the Asian subcontinent is looking at it when are the regulators allowing this space so that we can get into this space. They are also collaborating with younger people here uh, to, see, to make sure that the model is not exclusive, meaning that it doesn't have the local people in it. Yeah, this is what, uh, this is what I'm seeing in the space, yes. I, yeah. I don't think I knew any of that before you just said that, so thank you so much for that. And as you know, Demo's been talking about this push for digitalization, which you mentioned that COVID has done, and you gave some examples of that. What digital solutions have you seen working for MSMEs, and what are some of the concerns you're seeing in this push towards digitalization for, for, for micro and small enterprises? Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for that question, and that's it. Um, I think we've talked um, you know, quite extensively about um, you know, how digitalization helped in terms of the supply chain. In other words, you weren't able to get your goods from a particular place, therefore you were able to aggregate them with someone by use of digital and maybe then um, give them to your customers, you know, again by you know, using pictures, etc. However, what we also found is that um, a lot of um, MSMEs complained that um, they didn't have the cash that they required to be able to survive or to be able to um, actually come back. And um, we had to ask ourselves why, when you looked at the fact that there was actually a lot of funds available. And what you'd find there is that um, um, the, 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 where the funds were was a formal structure, but a lot of these MSMEs were informal and therefore they were not able to connect. And I believe that um, this is a space that um, actually um, digitalization can actually come in to actually bridge that gap and uh, probably shortcut the regulation that um, you know, we've been talking about for a very long time. And as I said earlier, um, the fact that now you can actually identify um, businesses and enterprises digitally, in other words, give them a digital registration, a di digital name, and then be able to use their data and you said big data in terms of getting some of their um, information, some of their history, and present that to financiers. I think that's a very important part that we need to, we can actually do. So I think that is one. So I think that if you're talking about what challenges are there, is, is how do you uh, ensure that the average um, person in Usuli has the confidence to come onto some of those platforms to be able to then be able to access a lot of those other things. The other thing I want to mention is that um, one of the um, market failures that we tend to have is, is communication of what is available. 
For instance, um, the government recently put up cold storages in Laikipia, in Nyandarwa. Um, but you find that um, by the time a farmer is able to connect with that particular cold storage or be able to get the information um, that they can actually do that, it becomes a problem. So I think, again, um, the use of digital means may be used in terms of trying to bridge that gap in terms of communication. Um, so I think there's a lot of different ways. I think the last one, since I have an educationalist here, mm -hmm. is that um, you know we're a very young nation. And what you find is um, a lot of um, the inflows into the MSME sectors are young people who are not able to find jobs. They're um, qualified, they've you know, done diplomas, so they go into the MSME sector. Um, it would be great if some of that information that they require can be given just as they're leaving school. You know, so you know, the, the, the kind of um, you know, a, a digitalization that's now happening in universities or even in, in schools is important so that they know that some of their options are X. And that would actually sort of um, uh, narrow the gap in terms of lack of, of communication. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. It's actually the trust, okay. the, the, the trust issue, and mm -hmm. this is the one that uh, some which want to come out and keep on going back. Um, and and uh, especially government didn't quite understand it by the introduction of the of the new tax. Um, that shocked them and moved them into moving forward into into that space. What the government should have done is that um, they would have used a carrot to get them into the digital space and then later on can tax. Uh, so that, that really shakes them because they, they want to remain under the radar, under the radar yeah. but at the same time they cannot remain there yeah. and be able to get money Rural, if they right? can't supply the data yeah. and be able to to get them to be understood by the financiers. Yeah, and I'm glad you said that because that links to the question I was going to ask you is that because of this divide, particularly between formal and informal, mm -hmm. um, this impetus to stay under the radar so that you're not getting hypertaxed, what we are seeing is that there's this inequality that's happening in terms of the people that have been able to leverage digitization mm -hmm. and those that are really being left behind. And of course, you have a view of that from your office. Um, so what ideas and actions are you working on as a very big bilateral partner with Kenya and you know, rest of Africa to ensure that those issues are, are addressed and that <coughs> the digitization is a force of inclusivity, not, not exclusion? Yeah, no, it's a, I mean, it's such an important question. And I mean, when you think about it, the, the risk of the digital divide is, is very real. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you think about certain people will not have access to the internet, they won't have a smartphone. Even if they do, they might not be able to pay um, uh, for access easily. So th there's, there's absolutely a risk uh, uh, that people like that you know, can, can get left behind. Um, the, the flip side is equally true. I mean, when you look at... Um, I think it's about 94% of, of, uh, of relevant Kenyans uh, use M-Pesa. I mean, that's, a, that's, that's just a very striking figure. Um, I recall the recent uh, research that suggests that about 30%, again, of people surveyed found that a, a, a sort of digital um, approach had helped them increase their income. I mean, for, for SMEs, that's just, that's just a fabulous uh, sort of uh, opportunity. So what, so, what, so what do you do to then uh, enable that first group to become more like the second group. So, I mean, I think education is absolutely key, and I think Anne, Anne has, uh, has put it very eloquently, um, and preparing for, for that digital future uh, that is coming. Um, we, we firmly believe cash transfers for the, for the most disadvantaged is, a, is just an amazing opportunity. We often uh, use them in the sense that it literally gets people food, enables them to, uh, to survive, and it's... Um, the operations point is really important. You can do that using M-Pesa and using biometrics. It's a very digital, safe, effective. I mean, there's literally the, the effectiveness of the operation and the effectiveness of the impact uh, is so high. So there's that, uh, there's that kind of uh, opportunity. And I think, the, um, I think the, the final piece of the puzzle that um, I think is tricky, and we're, we're, I think we're still scratching our head on it, and, and Professor Ndemo has talked about it, is is the regulation and tax part. How do you, how do you tax people that are, um, that are in a sense below the radar operating uh, in a very digital way? Uh, not easy, people around the world are grappling with that one. And uh, the same on the regulation side, where you have such an innovative sector, how do you, how do you sort of test uh, 
uh, some of these approaches uh, with a very fast moving sector where people are not sure, they're a bit nervous. So I think, I think that, that kind of the, the sort of sandbox idea yeah. uh, is something um, that we should be thinking about. The other bit of it is just the mindset of regulators. How do you balance off that huge opportunity with, um, with of course, you know, they're cautious people. They, you know, they, they, uh, they, they need to keep stability and there's a risk involved with these very innovative things. So, so I think thinking more about how you balance that opportunity and risk for the regulation yeah. uh, is another key point. Okay, that's really interesting because you were aware, obviously, technology is part of how you actually do what you do. And you started talking about it a bit, but, you know, one of the things that I've, I picked up in what you're saying is that you're looking at technology, technology in terms of the smart supply chain, you're looking at operations, you're looking at logistics, and then you've got the fintech as well. And that's been one of the problems that we've seen as FSD is that a lot of these innovations are quite siloed mm -hmm. in sort of the, 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 the problems that they're trying to solve. And then there's you who's sort of a consumer that's just trying to figure out how do I link all these solutions mm -hmm. to something that is actually effective to meet your mission. So can you maybe walk us through that in terms of how you get through all the different solutions to meet the mission um, uh, and vision that you have in your organization? Yeah, sure. I think, I mean, one of the things to point out is that the siloness is very real, that it's very difficult to kind of like from the supply chain side to the production, to the distribution, and then to the fintech. And a lot of times, even with the parents that we're working with, uh, when you mentioned the 94% of people using M-Pesa, some of them haven't been using M-Pesa. And so we're sort of teaching them how to use a USSD, you know, how to register their child, how to top up money on M-Pesa. So there's a very, you know, there some of them are the 6% who are not using M-Pesa and you're trying to get them into a digital means of it, ensuring that their kids get lunches. And so uh, from our, you know, thinking about our sourcing, one of the things that we're doing is thinking of our operations from you know food coming in ingredients being farmed actually to being uh, coming into our kitchens and then to cooking to distribution which using trucks and then to the child getting the lunch so instead of siloing that this technology is for this and this technology is for that we're thinking how do we apply technology to ensure efficiency because our key driver when you're in a fast moving uh, food business is cost so you're thinking, how do I lower my cost? Because parents are giving 15 shillings. Uh, or the meal costs us more than 15 shillings. It costs us uh, a bit more than that. And we're thinking, how do we make sure that we're coming as close as possible to that 15 shillings? And the key driver is technology. So when we're sourcing, we have a way for our, our sourcing partners to reach us and to give prices. And then when we're thinking about kitchen operations, we have dashboards that control kitchen operations. So we're estimating that Yesterday we cooked for 30,000 kids. Uh, today's closing day, we're gonna cook for 28,000. We're not gonna cook the same amount of food. We have to have a dashboard that tells us put in 500 kilos of maize, put in 1,000 kilos of beans. And that is a way that we're using technology to be able to lower our wastage, to be able to give us efficiencies. Uh, we now have a wastage of less than 3% across all our kitchens. And it's mostly through using technology, through predicting. This is the number of children that we're going to feed on Monday versus Tuesday. Because you know, when we started, we were cooking the same number of meals every single day. And technology has come in and our wastage was close to 10%. Mm -hmm. And now our wastage has really gone down because of using technology to predict how many meals we're going to produce. And then also using tap to eat to tell us that these are the payments, this is how you prompt parents. Mm -hmm. So also knowing when is the time to send a message to remind a parent to top up. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not 11 o'clock when they're at work. It's probably 5 a.m. when mm -hmm. they wake up and they're getting ready to go to work. So that also is using technology to prompt a parent, to prompt families to say, oh, your child is going to school today and they need to have lunch. Mm -hmm. And also from that, parents are getting real-time reports mm -hmm. of their child. My child went to school. Believe it or not, in a public school system, it's very hard to know if your child actually went to school mm -hmm. because you left home at 5, they left home after you, and then you meet in the evening. How do you know if they actually went to school that day? But through Tap to Eat, a parent can dial a USSD and see, did my child eat today? So that is a very easy way that we're using technology to create that accountability and efficiency and to use different forms of technology to ensure that our operations run smoothly. Wonderful. That's really interesting. And she's bringing up that human element, which is what I want you to talk about. And I'll 
So you mentioned it in your, in your speech, sort of the elephant in the room, that Africa's got this massive opportunity in the digital economy, but at the same time, that is a space of great power competition. So in your view, how have you seen that great power competition affect African players? And what have been some of the ways you've been seeing African players navigate that very real tension in an opportunity that's right there for us? Yeah, um, actually we wasted a lot of uh, many years um, during the Cold War, and we took positions which were not helpful. We couldn't make our own decisions as to what we want to do. And uh, because of the Cold War, we got the Mobutus, we got all kinds of things. Um, it would be completely unfair that we get into that space again. Um, to, to say uh, we want to take positions with China or with the U.S. I think playing like the U.N. does, that uh, multilateralism works, that your friends, you can have your friends and I respect you for that, would be the best thing for us going forward. Because, um, as I said, uh, the infrastructure you saw by yourself, the whole of Africa, um, especially the terrestrial fiber, uh, was actually funded by China. Uh, in as much as uh, the West says, well, there is corruption. Um, the, we can also say the same. Uh, the donor money we got, which I say it sadly that we need to stop uh, receiving um, donations because they make us dependent and not seek solutions. Um, much of it, even up to last week, the report from the Vodafone uh, stated that uh, much of it goes back to the Western world through consultancies. Actually, it's only 30% we got, um, which means that uh, we need to make our own decisions and see where we are getting the benefits from. Actually, without the investments by Chinese, we couldn't be where we are today because COVID came, there was nothing. There would be nothing on the ground. Um, I remember when we built the cable and they said uh, um, that we needed, uh, we needed to get some help. It was only $100 million, and uh, my minister, Mutai Kawe, said, why can't we raise the money locally, a PPP? And we started to raise the money. When we were getting the money, it's when the multilateral agencies came in and said, oh, you, this is going to be a white elephant. And we said we would move forward with it. Went to the Middle East, got a partner in Etisilat, and the local investors came in. We laid the cable, which proved that there is market. And that's when everybody came to invest in those cables. So if we had taken the advice that uh, our big brother doesn't think Africans can use broadband, we would actually be where we were a few years ago. So some things we must take risk and move forward um, and be respected with the decisions that we've made on the choices that we make. Thank you. Thank you for that. And we're going to start going through closing comments, but I do have the last question for you, Anne, which is, you know, you, you work in a space where there are so many players trying to work with micro, small and medium enterprises. And so in your, from where you sit, what do you think are the key actions that would be most powerful in unlocking all of the challenges you've been talking about that we're all very aware of, but also in a way that allows the micro and small enterprise to reap the rewards of the work that they do every day and they get barely compensated. So can you walk us through what you think those key catalysts would be? And are there examples from other countries that you find are particularly well suited for Africa? Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, thank you for that um, very broad question. <laughs> um, and just to say that, um, it is true that um, there's been a lot of work that has been done, uh, both by the private sector and by government in terms of initiatives, in terms of programs, in terms of funds across the whole MS, you know, for the MSME sector. But I think what we do lack is um, a collaborative um, framework to actually bring it together. 
And when you look at um, what we've discovered during COVID about the MSME sector and how critical and central it is to the economy, um, I think it behooves all of us to actually sit down and to rethink again, um, you know, how are we actually going to focus, be very intentional about growth in this particular sector, knowing that it links um, the average Kenyan and his livelihood. Uh, because most Kenyans are actually in the MSME sector, as we well know. Um, you know, I think, you know, um, just to quote some of the stats that are, that are here, we all know that um, the MSME sector employs more than 90%. Uh, so if you improve that particular sector, that means someone who was earning 3,000 can now earn 10,000. That means that a new person coming in can get employed in a more dignified way. So it's important that we actually focus on that. Now, when you look at, um, as you said, examples from other countries which we can learn from, um, there are many that we can actually learn from. Um, but the first thing that I've seen in all the ones that I look at is that they've done a deep dive into themselves, you know, because you have to localize a lot of these solutions. They have, the solutions are actually within us. It's just that we need a broader conversation, a more serious conversation to actually come out with what are the key areas. I think the key areas are what, um, you know, everybody knows are around market failure. One of them, of course, is access to finance. Um, I think that is critical. The other one is, um, do we have pro-MSME regulation and policies? Um, when you talk about the fact that, um, as Dr. Demo said, that just as people were starting to trust, to trust um, the digital um, environment, there's a tax there. That, that speaks to the fact that um, regulation is not speaking to each other. You know, there's, there tends to be a silo mentality, which is where a collaborative impact will come in. So I would say, um, let's look at our regulation make it uh, work for you know, the small businesses that are there to actually rise, um, access to finance, how do you get access to finance for all the different levels of MSME because we have to also recognize they're not all the same. You know, there's some who are startups, there's some who are small businesses that are mature, there's others that are export facing that we can even encourage. You know, so all of them need different things at different times and it's important that we begin to, um, to um, handle will address all those ta challenges. And of course, the third one is, is ensuring that there is proper market access, both domestically um, and also um, internationally and regionally. I think if we can do just those three things to start off with, I think it will catalyze and ignite a lot of the other um, um, actors within the sector. Thank you. That's true. And talking about financing, one of the things we are seeing coming out of COVID that there are these huge funding themes coming out on a global level, you know, whether it's about climate change, whether it's about digitization, whether it's about COVID itself, women's economic empowerment, that seems to be driving a lot of money, particularly in the development world. Um, so obviously, do these resonate with your office? And how, how is your office going about making sure that those funding themes actually speak to the development objectives of countries like Kenya? Yeah, so uh, a great, uh, really a great question. So I, I, think, I think as you put in your talk, Professor, the, the, the link between the sort of digital revolution and the COVID reset um, has, has made us all think. And uh, certainly a lot of those themes are the key ones. Uh, we're, as the UK, we're hosting the, the climate summit later this year. That is an absolute priority, literally for all of us. Uh, we've got to, we've got to, to think about that. And, and, and what it does, I think, is it gives countries like Kenya the opportunity um, to leapfrog some of these approaches. So, so whether it's in finance. So again, when His Excellency the President came um, uh, to London, he went to Mansion House in the heart of the city. And from that, you know, we launched the Nairobi International Finance Center and fintechs are talking to each other. It's, you know, it's not, it's nothing to do with us as government. They're, they're talking to each other over here and learning from each other and, um, and innovating and partnering. So that's the sort of, that's one example. Uh, green finance, you know, will be, will simply be huge in the future. Uh, we're looking at green manufacturing. I think it's, it's not very long be before you see a lot of um, electric boda bodas. Uh, on the streets of Nairobi and some of the other cities here. Um, that green manufacturing angle will be there. Um, so there's going to be a lot of themes like that, that, um, that uh, if, and, and in a sense, this is, this is one of the, I think, the key points uh, that I've taken from, uh, from Prof's talk, is this is about mindset. And if you can, if you can think about, okay, the, the world is going to be digital in the future, how do I use that 
to, have, to, to make my operations improved? Um, how, do I, how do I use that to, to think about new markets, new ways of, uh, of creating value? Then that's, that's, that's the kind of mindset. And frankly, Kenya is perfectly placed. I mean, the talent we've talked about, uh, uh, very connected, uh, we've talked about, and, and also this entrepreneurial culture. So those kinds of things give you um, a lot of, of hope that, um, uh, that this country will kind of be able to grasp these things on whatever area it will be and, uh, and, and will be able to innovate and create the value and exactly as, as professors outlined. So, so those two things, the mindset uh, and then the opportunity uh, is exactly, I think, what uh, we should take away from today. Thank you. And just now, but now to you, Aurora, just linking to that, you know, you're obviously very switched on and, and really finding ways to apply digital solutions in a way that work. What are the key innovations that you're looking forward to, especially in fintech, that would really help you um, do your work a lot more easily and, and with much deeper impact? If you can give us an idea of that. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the key things that we're, uh, we're doing, which I kind of alluded to, is really using technology to streamline operations. And because our scaling ambitions are, you know, we're, I said we're providing meals to around 30,000 kids right now. Um, and then in the next couple, six months, we'll be at 100,000 kids, and our goal is a million kids in the next five years. So thinking, how do we build, first of all, robust technology that is accessible across the board? So accessibility is a key thing for us in terms of how do we make sure that a mamamboga who has never interacted with M-Pesa before is able to dial on their phone who doesn't have a smartphone, was a feature phone where the buttons are sort of scrapped off and they can read and easily register their child and be able to, um, to have access. So one of the things we're introducing right now, which we're in testing phase, is agents. So can we take technology to where parents live? So when you're buying sugar, can you register for tap to eat? When you're buying your unga for the evening, can you register for tap to eat? Can you check your balance? If you don't have your phone, if sometimes you've seen issues with you know, if someone has a loan on their phone, they can't top up. So issues like that. How do we solve for that? And we're really looking at how do we make technology accessible to people. First of all, you know, the average of our parents are primary school level. So the, high, the average of our parents have reached class eight. So how do we take that knowledge that they have and make it accessible for them to have access to food for their kids? And then how do we take this technology that we've developed and continue developing it across the board from how we're sourcing, right? So how do we build a bigger network of farmers so that we're able to they're able to plug into our supply chain and how do we distribute food le uh, better in terms of logistics so we have very strict standards around what kind of food we distribute what time what is the temperature so how do we use technology to monitor for example the temperature of food in a rural primary school or in this other school so we're really looking at how do we use now get very <coughs> granular in terms of how we're able to get reports how we're able to action on those reports and how we're able to create access that so the most vulnerable you know the mama mboga who may not have access to data is able to have their kid on tap to eat and get lunch thank yeah. you thank you and finally i'll just end with you exactly you please do do say what you're going to say but i just want to say the last thing i'd want to ask is what is the single catalyst you think is required to center africa's priorities moving forward in that vision because we do see these competing interests it's actually my prayer that uh, governments in Africa, the whole of Africa, remove tax from devices, remove tax, tax from broadband, um, stop some governments from shutting down the internet, because it, it is a human right issue now about connectivity. And you can see the level of productivity that Africa has seen in the past few years, the growth that you saw there is coming from digitalization, the efficiencies that have been created in the economies. So we need to expand to more, more countries. I talked about Mamambogas converting from the traditional entrepreneurship they had to actually using digital, creating more time for the family. We need to begin to discuss more about collaborations about the new business models. The small company I talked about in the UK with chocolate in, in the West Africa, 
the divine chocolate company. We need to have the divine coffee company because our coffee is getting disrupted because farmers don't get anything out of it. We need to disrupt that. The divine tea, you know, all this. If we begin to talk about uh, new business models and remove ourselves from thinking about aid, uh, aid has never developed any country. What would develop the countries is to work collaboratively, develop new business models where everybody benefits in the supply chain. If we are able to achieve even half of what we do, you know, horticulture is growing with Europe, but do farmers get anything out of it? Yeah, we followed a watermelon from Nakuru to Nairobi. You know, the farmer gets 50 shillings. Then there are seven middlemen in between. So by the time you buy it in Nairobi, you are paying 400 shillings. The farmer got 50 shillings. Why can't we streamline that so that they get it? Luckily, we're having like um, Twigger Foods disrupting that market, giving more value to the farmer. Uh, they get their worth, and you begin to see farming becoming attractive uh, to younger people. This is what we need to do. We need to fit it around business models, which revenue models we have out of this. And we transform Africa. And as I said, inadvertently, we would get into manufacturing. Thank you. Yeah. And with that, I think we'll have to bring the panel to a close. I really do want to thank you all panelists for giving us such wonderful insights and wonderful things to talk about. And thank you, Dr. Ndamo, for your really insightful talk that will give us food for thought. So to make the cl closing comments, I'd like to welcome our senior innovation specialist, uh, Mike Mbaka, he's going to come forward. A lot of the innovations um, that um, Demos mentioned, um, he actually drives a lot of them, uh, particularly in the agricultural sector. So Mike Mbaka, please do come and make those closing comments. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Nzetsu, for leading that session. Yeah, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Pitanga Demo, for giving us a very insightful lecture and a very good uh, point uh, to ponder, both uh, as people in the industry, development industry, as well as the people in the government, as well as the entrepreneurs we have, and even the upcoming uh, people. And I'm very sure also it will be shaping even the labor markets that we do have as they look through and, uh, and see the opportunities that are presented uh, by the digital evolution that we have. So I would not like to repeat what has been said. Yeah, I cannot uh, repeat all the great things that have been said in the lecture. But I would want maybe to just uh, say in a parting shot my thoughts that um, as uh, he has uh, said that uh, the fourth industrial revolution is uh, around or it's already happening, and the digital revolution presents a bigger opportunity. And many speakers have said it's about um, how people take the opportunity or it may bypass us, especially in Africa where we have the right ingredients to take this on. So I think uh, it's a big opportunity and a big challenge for all the players to see how to take this opportunity because we have to develop it as much as the opportunity presents itself. So thank you very much to our panelists and uh, Mutai. Yeah, thanks for honoring us, Julia uh, Scott and Wawera Njiro, very insightful comments and uh, infusing it with uh, some of the work that you do on your day-to-day -day work. Yeah, and we are very honored to, to have worked with uh, all of you in various ways and uh, in driving various innovations in the in the country. Thank you very much. And that's it. Thanks for doing a great work in moderating and uh, bringing out questions that have enabled them to respond very well. And um, to everyone uh, else who has made this possible, especially our audience that are, have stayed with us, especially when we are in digital challenges. Yeah, so in the era of the digital we got into digital challenges. We apologize for that. And we hope as we upload the videos, they will be clearer and uh, you'll be able to get all the content as well as the slides. And uh, you'll be able to engage with that. So thank you very much for keeping with us all through to the end. 
And uh, to the media crew, thank you very much for being here with us and spending quite some time uh, preparing for this. Thank you very much. And the FSD team, yeah, for the various roles and the efforts that you've put in in seeing these uh, to have worked, thanks a lot. And last and not least, to our partners who we've learned a lot and we've observed a lot in this uh, space of innovations, thanks a lot. And least, I think we have uh, a lot of innovators in the country that I cannot go and mention. Yeah, some that are startups, some that are, yeah, some that have scaled up, and some that are the government that is doing a lot in the area of regulation, the development partners that are doing a lot to help facilitate uh, these in the private sector, as well as even uh, the think tanks and uh, the universities that are bringing up the talent and nurturing that. Thanks a lot, and uh, have a lovely evening.